All right. So are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So My name's Arthur Balkus, and uh, I spent uh, five and a half years in uh, Pentridge Prison, per se. Um, how I came to end up in prison is an interesting story because my background wasn't like many of the others that I met in prison. That is, low socioeconomic uh, childhood, uh, abuse, disadvantage, neglect, uh, progressing from juvenile offending uh, through the system into the adult system and spending years in and out or long periods. So that wasn't my, my experience. Uh, I, I, I came from uh, a Greek uh, working class background and uh, I had a pretty normal upbringing in many ways until I was about six when my father suffered a serious accident and was rendered an invalid pensioner. So we uh, became kind of poor overnight relative to other people and um, I grew up on welfare and that created a lot of hang-ups for me because getting charity at school and in all sorts of other ways, clothing and whatnot, hand-me-downs and, you know, it, it, yeah, it made me feel kind of inadequate or whatever. And growing up, I was pretty popular at school. I was a good athlete. I was fairly studious, well-liked by the teachers and students. And so I wanted to kind of live up to that image and um, in a materialistic world like ours is, um, labels define largely who you are. <laughs> and so, for example, with sport, if I wanted a pair of footy boots, um, a brand um, uh, sort of boot um, that was expensive, uh, the options were work for it, which I did from a very young age, but steal it if you choose to. And I started stealing at quite a young age and it developed into a bad habit. And to cut a long story short, by the time I ended up in um, um, senior secondary school, uh, I, I was successful in many ways, but also had a lot of uh, personal emotional issues. And part of the reason for that too was my, my parents, uh, my mother in particular, who suffered a lot. She was married at 16, she had miscarriages, she uh, endured a war, uh, a father who was a nice bloke, uh, but used to drink a lot and sort of take it out on her. And, and then coming to Australia, and in those days there was a lot of racism, there still is, <laughs> but uh, those early migrants uh, from Europe you know, copped a bit, but they worked hard and um, came here to provide opportunities for family. My mother suffered a nervous breakdown when I was a kid and um, had a lot of emotional issues. She was a really devout woman and every Sunday we had to go to church. Um, in fact, she arranged with the priest, uh, being Greek Orthodox, uh, she arranged with the Greek priest for me to become an altar boy. So for three years I had to do that uh, against my <laughs> wishes. Uh, I just found it so irrelevant to my life. I didn't understand it and didn't want to be there, but I had no choice. So I developed some, some resentment, if you like, towards religious people and the institution as I saw it. And I saw a lot of hypocrisy in it as a kid in the church. And I used to ask myself, why do people come here? I mean, I have no choice, but why do they come? They, 
you know, I, I didn't get that. And then at a very impressionable age, uh, 13, 14, where you go through puberty and you come out the other end confused about so many things, trying to work out who you are and you know, life and uh, sexuality, which is tough in itself. But at that point, my mother, through listening to a, a Greek evangelical program, became a, to use that term, born again Christian. And I thought she'd gone totally nuts because she took this religious stuff, as I saw it, to another level. Started talking about Jesus being in her heart and the Holy Spirit. And I thought, mate, she's gone loopy. And she sort of took me from the Orthodox Church to this other church where the environment was so different and people carried Bibles and, and, and they prayed. And they seemed earnest and they were nice people, but I found it so boring. I used to sit there and listen to these sermons and some of them were heavy. <laughs> um, and I used to count from like one to a hundred during the sermon and then I'd count back to one just to get through the time. And at the age of 16, I said to my mother, I'm not going anymore and you can't make me. At that point, my whole family, my sisters and my father had embraced the faith and I was the one who became the black sheep, so to speak. So I went off in my direction and they continued in theirs. Um, I did well in year 12. I was school captain and ducks of my final year and I was uh, voted by the teachers I heard, um, to be the student most likely to succeed in my life because I had so much going for me. And um, it was at that point that I made a really bad choice and that was to go to Melbourne Uni and study arts law. Arts was okay, humanities, I didn't mind that, but why did I do law? I did law because my father used to say to me, I want you to be someone successful, not like me a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, I wanted to be a sculptor because I was good with my hands, I was creative. I actually enrolled in this little college not far from here and they accepted me on the basis of my work. And so I was really wrapped, oh, I'm gonna be a sculptor. Um, and then when, when I uh, got really good marks, I uh, went off to Melbourne Uni and law uh, the other reason I chose to do law was I thought, well, if I become a lawyer, I'll have money. I'll never be poor. I'll have everything I want. So the motivation was really bad because it wasn't me. And right from the start, I just felt, I felt scared to tell you the truth. And in those days, Melbourne law was predominantly private school and I had nothing in common with them. So what I did was I kind of, um, tried to fit in by becoming like them. I did some crazy things. I remember I had a mullet, I cut it off because the conservative look um, uh, was the go in the, in the law faculty. Uh, I, I got rid of my old jeans and my banana boots from Queensland and you know, bought nicer, stole nicer clothes and I started to try and speak differently around my vowels and so forth and use big words. I mean, that was all about being lost. And, and uh, the further it went, the worse it got. I should have pulled the plug and said, look, I made a mistake. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go and um, do something else. But I kept going and the further I went, the more depressed I got. And no one knew about how I was feeling because I never talked to anyone. We didn't have any um, training at school. We didn't have uh, welfare officers or psychologists or um, Beyond Blue or anything like that. Um, and, and so I bluffed my way through to a certain point. I started struggling in my second year. By my third year, I was really in a bad way. I was drinking a lot, getting drunk. Uh, and one day at a 
disco, as they were called in those days. I met a young woman and she was a model. And she was, um, she and I kind of fell in love. And um, she introduced me to a, her world and I was really impressed by it. All the beautiful people uh, with the nice things. Um, and I remember because I sort of started to drift away from uni and spend more time having fun, um, my studies started to suffer. And then uh, I was introduced to marijuana. I'd never touched uh, drugs, even though I drank a lot. And I absolutely loved it. It, 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 it transformed me in ways I can't even describe. I felt so good, so confident. And before long, I was addicted to cannabis. And cannabis costs money. And of course, when there was no cannabis around, uh, because I needed a substance to cope with my life, I started using other things too. And before long, I didn't care what it was. I mean, if someone had come up to me and said, listen, this is, a, this is heroin and you stick it in your vein, I would have said, well, you know, let's go. So things got right out of control. Uh, I failed a subject. I dropped a subject. The effect of that was I lost my student allowance, which was helping me to get through. And even if I'd worked right through the Christmas holidays, which is what I, I used to spend a lot of time working during the holidays to save some money for the following year, um, it wasn't enough having lost that allowance. So I was desperate. And because I had a propensity to steal, I mean, I didn't wake up one day out of the blue and decide I'm going to go and do an armed robbery, but I progressed to it. And I say to people, armed robbery is another form of stealing. Um, it's at the high end and it's much more serious. But really, it's about planning it and going through the process and executing it. And at the end, you get handsomely rewarded too. Um, and so one day, I uh, disguised myself. I got an imitation gun because I didn't want to hurt anyone and I wouldn't have known where to get a real gun anyway. And I walked into a TAB on a Saturday afternoon and I walked out five minutes later, trembling inside my clothes, the greatest adrenaline hit I'd ever had in my whole life. And I had the equivalent of around 65 to $70,000. And that was the beginning of the end. Once you get money like that, which has no value because you didn't earn it and there's plenty more, why would you stop? And so I ended up in this fantasy, in this bubble, this crazy existence where I could buy and do anything I wanted. So after several months and another two robberies, um, I had three cars. I had the best clothes you, you could want. Um, I just spent my time on the beach, um, um, clubbing, um, traveling, uh, just having a wild time. But I was still depressed and I couldn't understand why. And then I broke up with my girlfriend because she kept asking me if I loved her. And I remember thinking, what's that mean? And I say to people sometimes, there's no way I could love her because I didn't love me. So I didn't have anything to give her. In fact, I was using her without even realizing it to make me feel better. It's really sad, isn't it? And I eventually broke up with her and then I went totally crazy for a month or two. And then one day I went to do another robbery and the police came along. And to cut a long story short, I nearly killed a police officer with his own gun um, in a struggle with him when they realized that I was actually there to rob the place. Because I didn't walk in with a balaclava, I would disguise myself. And then when everyone had left, I'd say, this is a robbery, take the money and leave. But that day this happened and uh, I panicked. And you know, I think about, I'll never forget the look on that officer's face when I held a loaded revolver over his face and my finger was trembling on the trigger. I could have killed him. 
could have been a murderer. I would have done over, I reckon, 20 years in here or more and maybe not survived it. And when I thought I got away, it was like a, a surreal movie. I remember looking in the rear vision and seeing all these police cars chasing me. And then there was a roadblock and I jumped out and I ran and I heard shots being fired. And then I realised they were actually firing shots at me, four of them, but they missed. However, they did catch me. And then I entered the criminal justice system. And one of the first things I learned is that it's not so just. <laughs> and I could tell you so many stories to illustrate that. Um, but if you haven't got money, you don't get justice because money will buy you a really good lawyer. And um, we didn't have that money. And anyway, I pleaded guilty. I didn't try and fight it. They had a lot of evidence. So I ended up getting a big sentence um, for a first timer, um, 11 years with an eight year minimum. And in those days you could earn remission on your minimum. So I ended up doing about five and a half. Um, entering this place, I'll never forget when the van door opened from the court and I stepped out and I looked at the facade inside the prison and I looked around at all these bluestone buildings and I thought, seriously, like this is it? Like I've got to live here? And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't sort of absorb it all. It was just a bit overwhelming. But I learned very quickly that was one aspect of being in prison. The really scary part was the people. <laughs> because, um, you know, a building's a building, uh, but human beings um, inside that building. And, and we're talking about an era where there was a lot of violence in this particular prison. And you had to acquit yourself. You had to find a way to show others that you weren't vulnerable. Because if you let them perceive that you were vulnerable, there were so many predators who were ready to take advantage of you, to use you, to hurt you. Uh, I was fortunate that I was like six foot tall and young and athletic, you know, fairly strong, and I was a good actor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you want to go, mate, do you? Yeah. And, let them kind of, but inside my heart was quaking. <laughs> um, the scary thing were, uh, though was that over time I, I started to kind of adjust to this environment. But everything that I adjusted to wasn't actually good. And the further it went, the more, um, um, the more my personality began to change and I started to do things and think things that weren't really me. Um, I, I kind of liken it to a bottomless pit. And I fell into this pit and the further down you went, the more kind of twisted, angry, depraved you became. I mean, I could talk about sexuality, for example. When, I, when they introduced televisions in D Division, I remember black and white TVs and there was a dedicated channel that screened pornography. Can you imagine? You're a young man, virile young man and you're in prison and suddenly, you know, your sexuality sort of cut off in terms of how you lived outside. And in prison, what are your options? What do you do? That alone can really begin to twist your mind. Um, Anyway, the long and short of it was, uh, as time passed, I got worse. And I really tried hard to overcome, to, to rise above, but I fell in slowly and surely. And when they moved me from here to Beechworth Prison and then to a country prison, uh, which you call an open camp, so you're there on trust, um, th the lower the security, the more I got into drugs. Drugs was, as with most inmates, because most inmates, most offenders are drug addicts, and that's why they're in prison, to get the money, to get the drugs. Um, 
the more I got into the drugs, the more, uh, the more messed up I became. And um, again, there are many stories to, to, to relate that. But um, eventually I, I was in um, a place called Moor River in sort of South Gippsland. And uh, crazy as it sounds, this, this open camp that I was in where you're allowed to go for walks in the bush and whatever, um, I was growing marijuana. I had a little crop growing about half a kilometre from the bu prison in the middle of the bush. And I was cultivating that. I was going to sell some. And uh, I just wanted to be stoned every day, as I was largely the whole eight months that I was there. Um, and then one day, uh, the dog squad came in and they you know, sniffed around and they found something that I had. And within an hour, I was in the back of a van coming back to Pentridge. And I remember being in the back of the van on my own and I was just totally devastated. And it wasn't because I was coming back here. I'd been here, f I'd done a year. I mean, I knew prison. I wasn't afraid of prison anymore. It was, it was that my life was totally devoid of any meaning. And I really, the person I was most afraid of, honestly, was me and my potentiality for this stuff that I'd fallen into. And um, I, I remember in the back of the van, I thought, because I had a lot of experiences with Christians in prison, <laughs> chaplains, um, prison fellowship people who would come in. And I met a few of them, right? But I kept away from them. And it was like I was scared of them. <laughs> uh, but I, I was always thinking, you know, is there a God? Isn't there a God? Uh, what's life about? All this kind of stuff. And in the back of the van, I thought, okay, give it a go. You've got nothing to lose. See if it's true. And it might sound funny to some people or simplistic to some people. But as a kid growing up, because of what I'd heard from so many different Christians and sermons and things, in this particular church. The message was, if you give your life to Jesus, you change and you become this other person, more like Jesus. So I thought, all right, I'll give it a go. So I remember I got on my knees, <laughs> you know, reverent sort of posture there. And I prayed the sinner's prayer, as far as I understood it, and that was to admit to God that I was a sinner. I thought, definitely, that's me. <laughs> Come into my life, Jesus. And I waited. I literally thought something would happen if it was true, and nothing happened. And I got up, and I was so angry. I started punching the panels, the metal panels of the van, so hard that I drew blood on my knuckles and I was cursing God and I was cursing my mother. So I got back here and they put me in a cell in D Division, cell 158. And on the second night, I stood there like this from knuckle tip to fingertip, touching both the walls. I don't know how long I stood there like that, but it was almost as if the feelings and emotions had drained out of me and I felt nothing. I felt kind of numb. And as I stood there like this, a little voice in my head said, why don't you take the sheet and tie it around your neck and hang yourself from the bar? And I really thought about it. Others had done it. <sighs> anyway, the next day, I was in the yards walking up and down, up and down, up and down. And as I walked, I had this weird experience. Like 
thought came into my head. Are you happy, Arthur? I thought, happy? Are you kidding me? Why don't you read the Bible? I thought, what? The Bible? Piss off. <laughs> and I kept walking, and the same thought came back to me again, and again, and again. I mean, to the point where I remember I stopped as I was walking and I thought, I'm going mad. I'm losing it. And then a sort of reason kicked in and I asked myself, well, what does the Bible say? What's it about? I've never read it. Why don't I check it out? Where do I, where do I find a Bible in here? So I went up to the gate and I called the officer and he said, yep. I said, can I have a look at the books on that bookshelf over there, please? So he let me through and I looked and I couldn't find a Bible. I was really disappointed. And then I turned around to leave and I saw a prison chaplain standing about three, four metres away outside his office. I thought, oh. And I knew it was a prison chaplain because he had a collar and a big cross here. So I went up to him, I said, can I talk to you? And he said, sure, come in. So we sat down, he said, what do you want to talk about? And I said, how can I find God in my life? Something like that. And he looked at me kind of a little bit um, confronted by the question. And he sort of said, oh, well, um, I fly hang gliders recreationally, and when I'm in my hang glider up there, I feel really close to God, and you know, we're all searching, and it sounds like you're on a journey, and um, God bless you, or whatever he said, and he had to go. And, and I walked back into the yard, and I thought, what a load of crap. I mean, I know more about salvation than he does. It's all rubbish and I walked away and the next day I got called to the office and the chief said to me all your property has arrived from the other prison and I want you to um, I want you to sort it out and send some of it home because you got too much so he, with an escort I had to go to the dungeon and I sorted through it and as I was about to leave I said hang on a minute officer I want to get a book to read and because I'd thrown all my books, study books, other books into this tea chest. And I went back in and I reached in and I couldn't see what the books were, it was dark. So I pulled out three books and lifted them up to the light coming through the window into the dungeon. And the middle one was the New Testament. And I looked at it and thought, recollecting the previous day. And I thought, what? How did that get there? And then I eventually remembered a guy called George who went to my mother's church, who used to give up a Saturday, a whole day, to drive my family, who didn't have a car, my parents, down to South Gippsland and back, six and a half, seven hour round trip. And one day I said to him, why do you do this? And he said um, something like, well, after Jesus loves you, and if Jesus was here, he'd, he'd visit someone like you and I thought that was a little bit corny but he was a nice bloke and he was useful said, oh, okay and then he said do you have a new testament and I said George I'm not interested if you bring one um, I'm going to throw it away or so I'm not going to read it well he didn't listen did he next time he came he left me a new testament in a brown paper bag and I remember when they gave it to me, the officers, I thought it was a box of chocolates and oh, oh. <laughs> I didn't. I must have kept it though. Completely forgot about it. There it was. So I'm thinking, what an incredible, is it a coincidence? What's going on? I, I couldn't, like, it was weird. I remember it was just such a weird feeling. I, I, some things. Anyway, I took that New Testament that night, stuck it in my pants so no one would see it because it was embarrassing. And as soon as they closed the cell door on a stinking hot summer's day, 
where the cell must have been, I reckon, 45 degrees plus. It was so hot. I used to take all my clothes off and keep as still as possible. And the perspiration would just drip off my body. And I started reading the Gospel of Matthew. And I read and I read and I wasn't conscious of anything but what I was reading. It's almost like I'd been sort of transported into this into this realm, these stories, this life of Jesus Christ. And then the light went out. It was 10 p.m. I'd read Matthew, Mark, and I stopped at chapter 11, verse 9 of the Gospel of Luke. And if you know that passage, that's where Jesus says, Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. That's where the lights went out. And I started crying. It was, it was from such a deep place in my soul. It was the purest prayer I ever prayed. I just, I remember I was calling out and saying, Help me, Jesus. I need what you say you can give me. And I did. I needed to find a reason to live. And um, I cried and I cried and I cried myself to sleep. And the next morning I got up and I felt strange. It's very hard to describe what I felt kind of lighter, kind of full of positive emotion. Like I felt like crying all the time. I had to hold it in. The cell door opens. Uh, I'm in the yards. I'm looking around, feeling this strangeness. And I see a guy in the yard, Paul. I knew him from outside and he cooked his brain on speed. He was quite mad. And he was standing there in the middle of the yard like a statue. And I walked up to him and I looked at him and I said, Paul, do you want some tobacco? Do you want some biscuits? And I'm offering him and he's kind of looking at me warily. And as I did this, a friend of mine entered the yard called Marwan. Marwan I knew from the prison that I'd come from. He'd come down to be transported elsewhere. And he was about eight, ten years younger than me, and he really looked up to me. He was a nice young man. And as he approached, he said, what are you giving him your things for? And then he stopped and he actually stared into my face. And he said, what's happened to you? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, this is what he said. He said, your face, your eyes, you're glowing. That's what he said. And I chuckled because it was a weird thing to say, right? But something was going on inside me. He was so taken by this that he took me by the wrist to the latrine <laughs> and there was a stainless steel sheet there which was meant to be a mirror. He wanted me to see what he could see. And if I remember he was looking around at other people to see whether they had it looking up at the sky and he said no just you've got it now what was that i'm still trying to work it out yeah god but it's an easy to say thing isn't it it was god <laughs> and people would say to me years later gee i wish i had an experience like that you know to confirm to have no doubts at all that there is god People who have been Christians for years would say that to me. You know, I wish I had. And I'd look at them and say, I actually envy you. I envy you because you, you have a faith. And okay, you struggle with it. We all do. But you haven't lost your, your purity. You know, you Look at what I went through. Would you like to experience all that? Because it leaves a mark. It doesn't just go away. Anyway, that was my 
<laughs> conversion. And after that, again, to cut a long story short, um, I was actually transferred to Ararat prison. In those days, it was a mainstream prison. I spent six months there and I was the Holy Joe of the institution. I was like the Apostle Paul, <laughs> going around, talking to everyone about Jesus. I got a reputation for being a bit of a weirdo. Um, I had some crazy experiences, but people around me uh, came to faith. We developed a, a group uh, supporting each other. I was eventually transported back to the prison I was in before, and for six months I fell away, lost my way, backslid if you want to call it that. But God was with me all the way through those experiences and eventually I recommitted myself to Jesus and almost at the same time that I was doing that my father died of a heart attack in the backyard of our house. I never understood why that happened and I'm still confused about it to some extent. Anyway, I got out of prison and I got married within three months, which I should not have, because I wasn't ready, to a really beautiful young woman from my family's church who wrote to me and befriended me and was probably the best witness, Christian witness of all the Christians I knew. And uh, I got a job working for the Bible Society of Victoria, heading up their new youth department. Um, that was a crazy time, a good time, but again, I wasn't sort of mature enough to cope with the exposure that I got, uh, running around, sharing my story, um, helping people, having people referred to me, like Christians, non-Christians, drug addicts, you name it. My marriage ended, I made some big mistakes and uh, went through a pretty harrowing time after that. I pulled out of ministry, I couldn't do it. I worked with Prison Fellowship there for a while with Reg Worthy and I pulled out of all of that and I started driving taxis. I did that for three and a half years. Um, got divorced. And eventually I met, I met another woman and she became my next wife. And we were happily married for 10 years and had two beautiful sons. And they were the happiest years of my whole life. Unfortunately, that ended as well. And that really, if I didn't have faith, I reckon I could have ended it all. I actually understand men who lose it to the point where they do terrible things, even to people they love and to themselves. I can understand that. Uh, fortunately, my faith and people around me who love me and supported me unconditionally, including my family, um, supported me through that process. Um, I did a lot of hard work on myself, counselling, men's groups, you name it. And the sum total of all of that is that I'm at this point in my life where, uh, where I've learned so much and at the moment I'm trying to share that through writing and I hope to have a book or two published um, imparting those lessons that I've learned. I, I should add one thing. I work with Prison Fellowship. Uh, I was approached by Prison Fellowship about eight years after um, I'd, I'd parted company with them initially and I was invited to join the board, which I did. And 
that was a good thing because I have lived experience of prison and when they had their meetings um, they would do all the administrative and other stuff which I didn't kind of understand much or was interested in but when it came to issues relating to ministering to prisoners I was in my element and so I made contributions there. I should add too that um, at one point there on the journey I went to uni again at the age of 40. I gave away work and went back to uni to finish my education but this time not law, criminology. And I spent uh, a few years, I ended up doing a master's degree in, cr in criminology and my thesis topic was the significance of Christianity in reforming prisoners. Um, there had been no research done on that topic in Australia at the time, a little bit in England and certainly a bit in America. And uh, what I was basically doing was revisiting my own experience and the experiences of others that I'd met in prison. And uh, my thesis findings uh, were the basis upon which Prison Fellowship eventually established a program called Lives in Transition. And it was a wonderful program. It was pre-release and post-release. And what made it really significant is that it was intensive and extensive. We spent five days a week for nearly four months with these 12 to 15 men. And that's certainly a solid amount of time to get the thinking patterns of people um, challenged and changed. Um, we had 60 volunteers, which was remarkable. That alone set this program apart. It wasn't run by clinicians and professionals doing a job. Um, these people cared about the prisoners. And that in itself is transformational. That's rehabilitation. And um, in addition to that, when the prisoner was released we set them up with somewhere to live we got them a job that they could cope with and we provided them with a mentor Look, um, a pretty well-known Catholic priest who was a chaplain in this prison for 30 years called Father John Brosnan, many years ago, famously made a statement. Now, as a criminologist who studied reintegration, <laughs> yeah, it's my forte, I know a lot about it. Uh, he kind of summed it up in these few sentences that I'm about to share. Um, he said that someone getting out of prison needs three things, essentially. They need somewhere decent to live. At least equivalent to being in prison. I've got a friend who is 53 and he has spent 36 years locked up. And the other day, he said to me, well, when I got out this last time, Arthur, they took me to a place in the back of the house. It had windows, but there was no glass in the windows. And they expected me to live in that place. The second thing someone getting out of prison needs is a job that they can handle. Not just any job. A lot of these people like my friend, um, he's never put in a tax return in his life. The reason is he's never had a job. He actually needs to learn how to work. So you can't just throw him into a nine to five, five days a week and say, well, this is how it's done. You've got to find an appropriate job to fit his personality and you need to kind of edge him into it gradually. So they need a job. They need to be occupied productively. And the third thing he said that they need is a friend. And then he qualified that and said, 
And the friendship is the hardest thing of all to provide. And he was so correct. When we ran that program, Lives in Transition, we provided each graduate with those three things. And I always knew that the weak link in that chain was the friend. Because one mentor, one good man, was not enough to deal with the needs of this prisoner. We say that it takes uh, you know, a tribe to raise a child, a community. That's what you need, a community. And um, I think that that's where, unfortunately, the system falls down. Because it's one thing to have programs and provide them with work and even somewhere to live. But if you don't provide the community, how are they meant to function? They need friendship. They need support. They need to belong. And someone has to provide that. That's the challenge. That's what was so transformational about the program that we ran. Just one little anecdote to illustrate. There was a famous prisoner called Peter Gibb. Peter Gibb uh, broke out of the Melbourne Assessment Prison with some gelignite. It's a long story. He was on the run with another inmate. He was eventually uh, arrested and I met him at Barwon Prison where we ran Lives in Transition. He wanted to do our program and the officer who came and told me said, but you don't want him. And I said, why? Oh, well, it's Peter Gibb, the notorious crim. He's been a crim all his life. And I said, no, on the contrary, I'd be honoured if he wanted to join our program. So I went and talked to Peter and I, I realised he was genuine and he was in. Well, you couldn't shut him up. He had a thousand questions. Highly intelligent man, not an educated, formally educated man, like quite a few prisoners I've met over the years. And one day he came up to me at the end of the session and he said, Arthur, that old bloke who spoke today, he apparently came all the way from Bendigo to Geelong to do this presentation. I said, yes. And then he said, how much did you pay him? And I said, I didn't pay him anything. He said, really? I said, well, I offered him petrol money, but he didn't want it. And then he looked at me quizzically and he said, why would he do that? You see, in his currency, in his world, you, you don't do something like that. There's got to be something in it for you. And then I said, why do you think he did it? And Peter looked at me and he said, because he cares. I said, that's right. You see, he did get something out of it, Peter. And Peter scratched his head and said, wow. You see, this is what I'm talking about. This is what changes lives. We assigned that old man to be Peter's mentor when Peter got out. But we need more people like him. We need people to roll their sleeves up and get involved. About six months after I became a Christian uh, and I'd been transferred to a prison called Wanron, I was called to the office one morning uh, because a couple of people had come to visit me and they were complete strangers. It was a guy called Reg Worthy and his wife Muriel. I didn't know these people and the governor introduced me to them and said they were from prison fellowship. And I said, what's that? And Reg Worthy, who was a really interesting man, um, he said, well, it's a prison, Christian prison ministry, and it's just started in Victoria and in this country too. And we just wanted to know if you were interested in having someone visit you from prison fellowship. And I said, uh, oh yeah, I guess. <laughs> 
And so the following week, uh, I was called out for a visit on the Saturday. And there was a little grey-haired woman and a grey-haired man. And I thought, who are these people? Well, they were from Prison Fellowship. They were among the first volunteers and they were a farming couple from a little town called Yina in South Gippsland. Now, the, the most enduring memory I have of the, these people coming to visit me um, for quite a long period of time was sitting there with Dib Bloom and having her hold my hand and just graciously, gently stroke it. Uh, I remember that so vividly. And the reason I think I remember that is because I was being loved and uh, I really needed to be loved. I mean, it's one thing to say God is love, but you know, it's a statement. Um, I needed to feel it in my heart and in my body. And Dib Bloom provided that for me. Bless her heart. So, so this was um, the beginning of a journey uh, with an organisation that of course, was founded by Charles Colson, and I had the wonderful privilege of meeting Charles Colson in 1986. Uh, we we travelled in light aircraft with Reg and a few others um, to Ararat Prison, where I was a prisoner. I shared my story with the inmates, and Chuck Colson got up and spoke. And I remember Chuck Colson, this imposing figure this highly intelligent man. The thing that impressed me most about him is what impressed me um, about Ron and Dib Bloom and people like that was his incredible humility. His humility. Um, a man who'd actually had an experience of imprisonment, so he understood. He didn't just sympathise, he empathised with us. Um, and I was so grateful for him and people like him over the years who, who invested in my life. I, I remember at Prison Fellowship in the, um, in the first office that they had in Ivanhoe, um, opening the door and there being an old woman who was just about to exit and she sort of craned her neck and looked at me and said, who are you? And I said, my name's Arthur Balkus. And she gave me a smile and she said, oh, that's lovely. I've been praying for you for the last few years and now I have a mental image to pray for. And off she went. And I just stood there <laughs> blown away um, that this person had been praying for me so faithfully. So, so this to me is what Prison Fellowship's about. Uh, you know, without support from good people, I know, I have no doubt at all that I couldn't have made it. I couldn't have made it. I couldn't have made it on faith alone in the sense of a belief system. I needed, as I said before, to be embraced and loved and helped. That is critically important. My research for my thesis, The Significance of Christianity in Reforming Prisoners. It, it affirmed what I knew to be true, and that is that people who embrace faith in prison and come into the community have a lot of trouble assimilating the church because the church, Christianity in this country, is middle class. And Nearly all of these people don't come from a middle-class background. They come from backgrounds that are really difficult and different, broken. And they need support. They can't just magically fit in. They need to learn how to fit in. 
Um, when we talk about rehabilitation, I think what we are, are often saying is we want you, offender, criminal, to become like us, to think like us, to live like us, to be like us. But for that to happen, these people need to be embraced and they need what that means modelled to them. That's the best way to learn. And that's why prison ministry is so incredibly important. I think it's one of the toughest ministries that you can do, but I think it's also one of the most rewarding. Um, and I think it's for good reason that Jesus, that I, the Jesus that I fell in love with that night in that prison cell, um, the Jesus who holds me together today and is the only reason that I call myself a Christian, no doubt about that. That same Jesus, if you look at his life, seemed to care most about these broken people. The last and the least of these my brothers, he said. When you minister to them, when you help them, when you visit them in prison, you're doing it for me. Matthew 25, when I read Matthew 25, oh, it, was, it was incredible. I thought, wow, Jesus is elevating the people that we reject and despise most. He elevates them to a holy status. And I think there's no way around that, that if we're going to be true to our faith, to our calling, if we're truly going to model the lifestyle of Jesus in our lives, we have to do these things. We have to care. We have to try and put ourselves out there, hard as it might be. And I've always said, to be involved in a ministry like this, that you will ultimately get more out of it than you ever put in. And I firmly believe that. Um, so I encourage uh, you to support Prison Fellowship. Prison Fellowship is the largest organization in the whole of the planet Earth that support prisoners. And it needs help. So in whatever way you can, as a volunteer, as a financial supporter, um, a prayer supporter, um, get involved and you will be blessed. That much I can guarantee you.